Welcome to Spirits Podcast, a boozy dive into mythology, legends, and folklore. Every week we pour a drink and learn about a new story from around the world. I'm Amanda. And I'm Julia. And this is episode 164, Vampires and Only Lovers Left Alive. It's a myth movie night. Myth movie night. Listen, pop that popcorn, put whatever wild topping you want on it. I like some nutritional yeast. Yes, I was a vegan for six years. Yes, I'm super into yeast. Love, love a yeast. Maybe you want to put a little bit of like, I don't know, dry blood powder or something like that because we're talking about vampires. Hell yeah, we are. This might be one of our top five most requested topics and what better way to get into vampire history and lore and other media adaptations than a movie I referenced far more than I think anybody else ever has. Only Lovers Left Alive. That is true. That is absolutely true. I haven't seen this movie before now, and Amanda, it was a good, it was a good choice. I think it's up there with my favorite vampire movie, my favorite <gasps> being Let the Right One In. Incredible. I, I'm so glad to hear it. Do you know who I would let in every time if they knocked on my door? <laughs> sure, tell me. <laughs> our newest patrons, B and Debra. Welcome. Thank you for joining. You join the ranks of all of our patrons, including our distinguished supporting producer level patrons, Philip, Megan, Debra, Molly, Skyla, Samantha, Sammy, Neil, Jessica, and Phil Fresh. Yeah. And our legend level patrons, Brittany, Whom Josie. I sent the cutest pins this month. Oh my goodness. I really wanted to keep some for myself, but I got one for you, Julia. <gasps> so kind. Thank you. Well, they are Brittany, Josie, Kylie, Charlotte, Kyla the Husky, Morgan, Be Me Up Scotty, Audra, Chris, Mark, Mr. Folk, Sarah, and Jack Marie. Love them. And Julie, what would we be sharing with the legend level patrons if they came over to our house while we recorded this episode? Well, I wanted to pick something that felt like genuinely old to go with the fact that we have pretty ancient vampires in this film. But yeah. uh, the concept of the cocktail, as we know, it kind of only dates to the 1860s with like the more popular ones that we think of today coming in around the Prohibition era in the 1920s. So for this one, I chose to make an aviation. So mm. it has kind of like that red purple tinge to it. It's got gin, maraschino liqueur, creme de violet and lemon juice. Delicious. Mm. Little cute, little classy, and a little bit vampire-y. Well, I actually wanted to make a themed recommendation this week as well. Ooh. Tell me. Tell me what you got. I recently tore through this memoir in about uh, 12 hours. Blood, Butter, and Bones by Gabrielle Hamilton. Ooh. So uh, Hamilton is a chef of the restaurant Prune here in New York City, which is like a, a really delicious, like French-inspired uh, bistro, basically. And I had heard of her as just like a figure in the food world. She's not one of those, like, she's not a TV chef and not a celebrity chef um, in that way, but she's hugely influential. And she was cited in another book I recently read called Burn the Ice, like a history of the sort of renaissance of restaurants and cocktails in America. So when you mention the kind of prohibition era cocktails, the idea of a speakeasy, a bunch of the bars that we frequent here in New York City were mentioned in this book. But then someone was like, oh, yeah, Gabrielle Hamilton mentored me and I would not be a chef without her. And I was like, I need to know who this person is. So wow. she wrote the memoir, Blood, Butter and Bones, about her upbringing, um, her kind of inspiration, why she loves food, how she started a restaurant. And it was just one of the best written memoirs I've ever read, period. Um, and I just like I'm left with so many sharp images from reading it and like smells and tastes almost, you know, the the way she describes the food. So if you're into the more kind of like history side of things and what makes American dining so interesting and like, is it going to end the sort of oral history of the last 20 years of food and drink in the U.S. as burn the ice? And then Gabrielle Hamilton's memoir is Blood, Butter, and Bones. Wow. Dang. Great recommendation. Love it. Thanks. You did good. In terms of recommending people to do and, and see things, Amanda, I hear that we are going to be in a couple of different places soon. We sure will. We would love, please, to see your beautiful faces in L.A. on February 15th. Those are a limited number of tickets. So if you can come see it, please bring a friend, bring a buddy, bring a date, bring uh, that neighbor who you know has some cool pins and would probably love spirits as well. The tickets are at multitude.productions slash live, as well as tickets to our upcoming double bill with Join the Party on February 27th in Austin and our upcoming live show in a museum in Boston on May 6th. I'm so excited to just perform in a museum. LA and Austin, I'm also very excited to perform at because I haven't performed there yet. But also, yeah, 
Boston Museum. I know it, it's going to be incredible. Most uh, most urgently is, you know, we definitely want to see your faces in L.A. So if you live in California or the greater L.A. area or you're coming into town for a podcast movement, which will also be uh, giving some talks at, come on over and join us. Yeah, it's going to be a blast. Also totally said that memoir title wrong. It's Blood, Bones and Butter. But, you know, Google the three words, you'll get there. Yeah, eventually. Well, without further ado, please enjoy episode 164, Vampires and Only Lovers Left Alive. Amanda, I know that this is uh, your favorite vampire film of all time. It is. Uh, which I think means it's the perfect time for you to do our two-minute summary. I feel like I always do them. Is that not no, true? No, I did the last one. It was the uh, the the ghost of uh, Christmas, spirit true. of Christmas. That was that's it. right. That's right. I got my I got my timer. Hold on. Hold on. I'm gonna start one as well, so I am also equipped with the knowledge. All right. So if you don't want to be spoiled for this movie, please skip forward exactly two minutes, and we will be all done with our summary. Ready? So go. Only Lovers Left Alive. We have Adam and Eve, just super on the nose here. Lots of references. Uh, There are two vampires who are extremely old. Adam, Tom Hiddleston, lives in Detroit, where he is a famous musician, but is very, like, secluded and doesn't want people to know who he is. Then Tilda Swinton is Eve and lives in Tangier, where she hangs out with Christopher Marlowe, who apparently faked his own death and also wrote all of Shakespeare's plays. Um, And Adam is feeling rough. He uh, got, like, a wooden bullet and is contemplating suicide. Tilda Swinton is hanging out in... In Tangier, but realizes that he is in a tough place. So she goes to Detroit to comfort him. And however, their kind of situation where they're kind of comforting each other, figuring it out, uh, is kind of disrupted when um, Eve's younger sister, Ava, comes in from Los Angeles. She is just like kind of off the fan. She gives Ian this flask that she secretly filled with blood, this cute guy Ian. And then Ava accidentally kills him uh, by drinking too much of his blood. So Adam like kicks her out. They're sort of need to leave. They go back to Tangier. They have to like carry only the things that they have with them on the plane. And then they visit Marlo being like, hey, uh, we are desperately hungry. Adam can no longer go to his like hookup at a local hospital to get blood. And they find out though that when they get to Marlo's house that he had died from accidentally drinking poison blood. And that was so like like brutal and sad. And so the two of them are just like staggering through the streets. They're so hungry and they see like a lovely couple who no doubt remind them of themselves back when they were first made. And then the movie closes with the two of them like going toward the couple to uh, drink their blood and turn them into vampires. Wow. Under two minutes. I'm very impressed. I did make some notes in case okay, I could do good. this. That was smart. I, I... <laughs> I'm very impressed regardless. Thank you. More than the, you know, the plot of the movie, there are just so many themes that I really love. Like there are a ton of artistic references to different, you know, both like the portraits in Adam's house. There are the names that people take on um, and they all kind of reference great art throughout the ages. The two of them talk about art a lot, listening to music, looking at art, talking about like Mary Shelley and other people that they have met and apparently drank from um, or, or been lovers with over the years. And more than anything, I sort of have a sense of like, Uh, boredom and the sense of, you know, when you're alive for that long, how do you maintain, I don't know, how do you maintain momentum and growth and is just like hedonistic pleasures, uh, like sex and art enough to sustain a life? Um, And and what do you do when you kind of want more or different? Yeah. And I feel like those are topics that a lot of vampire media tends to focus on and like really examine because, in a lot of ways, like the vampires we know it now through movies and books and TV uh, are these immortal beings that can live forever so long as they're sustained. And so, of course, they have like, you know, have experienced culture in ways that our short lives cannot and also have to deal with these everlasting lives, which probably can lead to boredom and, uh, you know, existential crisis. Yeah. And I also, as I was doing some research on more like the media side of vampires, like adaptations um, of different vampire works and just depictions of them throughout time, I did realize how like cinematic um, our idea of the vampire is and the vampire myth. Like these are kind of aesthetic beings, you know, that we want to look at uh, versus something like a werewolf where often a movie will cut away or they'll kind of like hint at it and then you kind of see like a a more gruesome depiction of a creature um, versus vampires who are often beautiful, often 
rich um, in a lot of the kind of adaptations that I'm going to walk you through. They are the height of power or they're like a thriving underground society. So um, there's just kind of resources there that a lot of um, other kind of othered groups in mythology and folklore media don't uh, get to have. Yeah, absolutely. Would you like to start with kind of a historical run through of different vampires across the world? Or would you prefer to talk about the media as we understand it and then explore kind of where those roots came from? I would love to hear your part first, because I think that'll let us kind of pluck out different references to vampire lores uh, around the world in the versions that I have found. Yeah, and feel free to interject when you hear something that you think is a reference to what the media has portrayed vampires as, and I would be happy to uh, talk about that. Well, I will. Thank you. Awesome. So I guess I'll start with the fact that I was doing my research and a lot of internet research about vampires online is sketchy at best because I feel as though media portrayals of things have really influenced the way that we see the historical vampire. Mm -hmm. So, um, for example, a lot of sources online say that the term vampire first appeared in English in 1734 in the poem The Vampire of the Fens. But, like, I can't find a copy of that online or made reference to in anything other than the fact that that is the first appearance of the word right you know that's so that's kind of like that's kind of going to give you an idea of what researching vampires is like unless you're very specifically looking at a type from a certain region yeah so uh sort of one of the wonderful facts about vampires is the fact that they occur across the world and therefore they vary in terms of how we identify them. So some of the oldest vampires or vampire equivalents, because as you'll see, the idea of the vampire is kind of just like they either suck blood or life force. That's mm-hmm. what cre- that's what we consider a vampire. Um, not necessarily like, oh, they live forever or they turn into bats or other animals and right. et cetera, et cetera. So Some of the oldest ones uh, date back to ancient Sumerian and Babylonian myths from around 4000 BCE. One example being the Ekemu or Idemu, uh, meaning one who is snatched away. And that is a spirit of a person who was not buried properly and then returns as a vengeful spirit and would suck the life force out of the living. Ooh. Uh, The Babylonians also believed in Lilithu, which is similarly associated with the Hebrew story of Lilith, who is the first wife of Adam and Eve, which made me giggle thinking about it while watching the film. Yeah. So Lilith, according to stories, uh, refused to be subservient to her husband Adam and then was banished from Eden and became queen of the demons. So she and her daughters, which are known as Lilu, uh, would prey on young babies, new mothers, and young men subsisting on their blood. The Sumerians had a different version of Lilith, uh, where she was said to be either an infertile, beautiful woman who would choose a lover and then feed off him and never let him go, or alternatively, she was said to be a bird-footed, demonic woman who would attack at night and again would feed on the blood of babies and their mothers. Hmm. Reminds me of the Aswang a little bit, too. Yes, and we'll get to the Aswang and various forms of it later on. Don't worry, I got you. Okay, cool. So speaking of Jewish traditions and Lilith, there was also another term called the aluka, which was uh, used to mean horse leech, which like quite literally could mean a type of leech that would feed off the throats of animals, Mm -hmm. but was alternatively used for a bloodlusting creature or a vampire. Uh, Other interpretations said that it was a living human who could change their shape into a wolf or could fly by releasing its long hair, like the hair would be tied up and then in releasing it, they could fly, which is extremely cool imagery. I really, really like that. Oh, yeah. Uh, it was said that if the person, it was said that the person would die if they were prevented from drinking blood for an extended period of time, which is very similar to modern vampire myth as we know it today. Yes, uh, and that instead of like being demonic in life, they only thirsted for blood. But if they died without, if they died because they hadn't been drinking blood, they would then turn into a demon in death. Oh no! Yeah, so I like, I kind of like that imagery. The idea that it's like. A person has to continue feeding, and if they aren't able to, that's when they become demonic. Yeah, it's like an even more tragic version. 
Yeah, seriously. In order to prevent this from happening, though, you could bury the person and then fill their mouth with dirt, and that would stop them from transforming into a demon. Wow. There's a lot of, like, burial and grave dirt associated with these myths. Yeah, for sure. And that's, like, not just Middle Eastern and Western tradition, too. I'll talk a little bit more about another version of that, where it's, like, burial place is a reason that vampires can be created. Cool. Well, I guess part of that, too, like, it's sort of coming to mind now, and I'm sure we'll see it traced in other stories, but, like, the main appeal of death is that it is the end of like our our needs and like our mortal like suffering and the daily relentless need to like meet our body's requirements um and the idea yeah that like you could spend death even more insatiable for something that's hard to get or in the previous example that you just listed they're sort of like damned if you do and damned if you don't is i think so like poetic but also resonant because death is supposed to be like an absence of of need and pain and here it's you know a different kind of it yeah and i think that also plays on the idea that despite the fact that like in a lot of traditions death is the end of suffering people are still afraid of the end of that because it's the only existence that they know exactly yeah to continue on just to finish up with uh lilith Later stories from Central European Jewish traditions that touch on Lilith. These stories say that she can transform into a cat and can charm victims, which is similar to the modern interpretation that we see in media of the glamour, the vampire glamour. Mm. Yes, which is basically mind control in order to subdue victims. Interesting. And there's like, there's so much literature about Lilith specifically. I know we could probably have like a whole podcast with like 25 parts about um, about her whole uh, history and also different like interpretations. Yes, there, there's a lot of really interesting stuff about Lilith. I'm going to put that on the schedule for some time in 2020. Yay! I think that would be a lot of fun. Moving on to other parts of the world, Africa has a few vampiric beings, though my personal favorite comes from Madagascar. It is known as the Ramanga. And it is a living vampire, meaning it's not undead. It's just a person who, mm-hmm. uh, like, desires blood. Uh, they are said to drink blood and eat nail clippings, but only of nobles. Oh, you got to be discerning. And, like, I feel like this movie in particular touches upon that. We could talk yeah. a little bit at the end about, um, like, blood purity and, like, the drinking of virgin's blood and stuff like that in vampire tradition. But... Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I'd love I'd love to delve into that a little bit more later. There are several folklore traditions around ghoulish or vampiric entities in Asia as well. In India, there's the story of the Vitalis, which are spirits or ghouls that inhabit corpses. They were said to, once they inhabit the corpse, uh, they would hang upside down from trees in cemeteries and cremation grounds. So kind of like a like a bat. Yeah. And then in northern India, there is the Bra Marakshasa, which is a creature uh, with a head that was encircled by intestines and then a skull that would drink the blood of humans. Ooh. Mm, some good body horror in there. Mwah, yeah. Perfect. Love it. Um, speaking of body horror, a popular vampire characteristic in Asia is the ability to detach parts of their upper body. So shout out to the Philippines for (laughs) two versions of, depending on what the, uh, the association is and where the story is coming from. Typically they are associated with the Aswang. It is the Mandorogo, which means bloodsucker and Mananagal, meaning the self segmenter. Ooh, that is so bad and good. (laughs) Um, So these creatures are said to be a form of our good buddy, a swang, like I said. They are said to appear as an attractive woman by day and at night develop wings and a proboscis-like tongue that was used to feed off of fetuses in pregnant women's wombs. Uh, And Mm -hmm. when they develop those wings, they would separate their upper torso from their legs and just fly around like that. Yikes. I love it. God, shout out uh, Filipino spirits listener base. You are so proud and vocal. (laughs) Interestingly enough, they're also known to eat entrails and weirdly enough, the phlegm of sick people. Oh, I mean, okay, go for it. I I hope that one's like kind of helpful in a way. It's like you go to sleep with a stuffy nose and then you wake up with no stuffy nose. You're like, (laughs) 
Thanks, bud. You know, if would you, Julia, if you were coming down with a cold, um, allow a proboscis like tongue into your nose while you slept to take out all the sickness, but then you're not sick anymore. I was gonna say, if I was asleep, I would yeah. have no problem with it. Yeah, no, I think I think awake is a step too far. But <laughs> no, if I have to watch it happen, I don't think so. Go for it. <laughs> Moving on from the Philippines, the Jiangxi from China, they're not typically what we would classically think of as vampires. So they're corpses that are reanimated through magical means, usually in order to return a body to the family if they were to die elsewhere. So again, talking about like the importance of where the body is buried and burial practice in particular. Yeah. So a sorcerer would be hired by a family in order to reanimate the corpse uh, with a piece of spell paper, which was then attached to their forehead. One of the most interesting aspects of the Jiangxi to me is uh, because of rigor mortis. It doesn't say explicitly because of rigor mortis in the story, but typically because of rigor mortis, the Jiangxi are only able to move around via hopping. So they would Mm. hop after the sorcerer as they led them back to the family's estate. However, if the spell paper were to be removed either accidentally or if the sorcerer was unhappy because he wasn't being paid properly for his (laughs) services, uh, the Jiangxi would become dangerous and would go about killing the living and absorbing their life essence. I was going to say it reminded me a little bit of Golem um, with the kind of like word on the forehead bringing them to life, but taking away a golem's word or erasing it just like deanimates them versus makes them uh you know uncontrollable or evil and this brings up an interesting point too because um if we look at say frankenstein as a golem equivalent or um a a play on that story uh the fact that the once the like the frankenstein's monster is rebuffed by his creator um, he, you know, becomes violent and goes into a rage, basically. So it's very similar to the Jiangxi in that way. I know. If you haven't read um, Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, really give it a go. It's it's very short. And it's one of those classics where I was like, oh, I get why this is important now. And it is so much more nuanced and interesting than the adaptations that I'd seen up to that point. Um, because, yeah, like he the creature doesn't um, doesn't just kind of lash out and like arbitrarily decide to become chaotic like he's rejected and hurt and that to me is such a more compelling um kind of reason for what looks from the outside like monstrous behavior i also think like and not to go off track about frankenstein frankenstein's (laughs) monster i also really like the idea of like even if the the creature wasn't rebuffed by dr frankenstein who isn't a doctor he's a grad student basically yeah um even if he wasn't rebuffed the horror of being like born again i feel like would be enough to drive a person to like lash out just because it's like the horror of like and again this is going back to the vampire idea where it's like where we finally have to like in death we finally don't have to like have these needs met and we can finally rest and to be brought back from that rest back into the world of the living in like it's like literally a violent way like the creature has every reason to lash out. Yeah, they um they definitely depict him as more of a like newborn, like blank slate, but parts being collected from deceased people, there's absolutely, I think, an argument to be made that there is some kind of like pent up, you know, either consciousness or suffering or just like the body remembers, you know, type yeah. situation. And oh, that's really interesting. Mm. Anyway, uh, let's finish up a little with some European vampire traditions, just because they're probably the most well-known between the two of us. And then we can get to your uh, media stuff after we get a refill. Yes, so yes, yes. Um, in Albania, the Sliga is a vampiric witch that would feed on the blood of infants and could turn into a flying insect like a moth, a fly, or a bee. Oh, that Rita Skeeter-ish. Mm, big mood. In Romania, vampires were known as moroi, and a human could become one if they were... Basically, it was just like, there's a bunch of different qualifying factors where, like, born with, like, a birth defect, like an extra nipple or a tail or extra hair somewhere, means that one would be doomed to become a vampire in death. Hmm. Um, another one... Being that uh, if the seventh child of a family uh, 
would and like all of the children were born the same sex Mm -hmm. that child would then become a vampire in death and basically there's a whole other bunch of like circumstances in pregnancy that basically doom someone to become a vampire to the point where i'm like genuinely surprised that there are not more vampires (laughs) It's just like, well, if your mother sees a black cat while she's pregnant with you, you're doomed to become a vampire in death. I'm like, that happens so often. I know. There would be so many vampires. It's it's another example of like how society is so obsessed with like policing the pregnant body and and making uh, during pregnancy people act in the most like ridiculously like capital V virtuous way mm-hmm. and ugh, ridiculous. Yeah. Romanian vampires are said to bite their victims either over their heart or between the eyes, which makes them unique compared to other vampires. Usually we see the neck biting right. or going for the main arteries, but I like the idea of between the eyes. That's a really interesting interesting one yeah and i feel like i've seen over the heart or read about it but i think that's more just a like romantic connotation yes Yes. it's that's the sexy vampire listen right to the source like i respect it so in south slavic folklore vampires are said to develop slowly over time this is my favorite version of the vampire origin story so in the first 40 days of making a vampire for instance uh they appear as a shadow-like creature and gradually gain strength as they feed off of people uh taking the shape of a jelly-like boneless mass and then eventually (laughs) forming into a mirror version of who they were in life so interesting and very Frankensteinian. I like that a lot. I just like the idea of the the, the gooey body. <laughs> so unsexy. Same. <laughs> there are several ways of identifying vampires across the world. My personal favorite, I will tell you, is the Romanian version where you put a seven-year-old boy dressed in white on a white horse and then you just let them loose in a graveyard (laughs) at midday and then wherever the horse stops to eat that's where the vampire's grave is oh no (laughs) it's very very cute oh anyway um and there are various ways to kill vampires depending on where you may find them and this list was compiled by um, an article on thought catalog uh you can burn it You can bury the corpse face down. You could drive a wooden stake through its heart. You can pile stones on the grave. You can put poppy seeds or wild roses on the grave. You can boil the head in vinegar. You can place a coin in its mouth. Pickle a vampire head? No, thank you. (laughs) You can can place a coin in its mouth and decapitate it with an axe. You can put a lemon in its mouth. You could bury it at a crossroads. You could remove the heart and cut it in two. You can put garlic in the mouth and drive a nail through the temple you can cut off the toes and drive a nail through the neck and you can pour boiling oil on the body and then drive a nail through the navel yikes yeah so many references to like pickling and roasting but also violence <laughs> a lot of cooking going on yeah. in the vampires i'm not sure how i feel about that maybe it is because i have been trying to like perfect my roast chicken technique but i'm like oh yes no lemon lemon in the cavity that's great of course a little bit of garlic in there too and then you uh, you put an axe through its temple oh no <laughs> it's not that far off from a roast chicken you're <laughs> no, absolutely it's really right not. it's really not <laughs> boiling the head in vinegar also probably pretty delicious yeah, or like ways that you like humanely kill shellfish before boiling them, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, Amanda, that's my kind of brief overview of vampires. Again, I'm sure we could do a whole series on different vampire lore from different parts across the world, but we just wanted to kind of touch base on this since it applied to only lovers left alive. Totally. Well, I am delighted to tell you about the vampire media that I found. But first, why don't we grab a refill of this delicious cocktail? Let's go get some aviations. Julia, we are sponsored this week by Calm. And as you know, especially when traveling, it is hard to kind of find those moments of relaxation and peace and not like thinking about where you're going to go next or if you're on time for stuff or like where you're going to find a good meal. So I really enjoy using Calm to kind of keep myself centered while I'm traveling as I am today when this episode comes out. So Calm is the number one app for sleep, relaxation and meditation. They have, of course, those famous sleep stories, which are bedtime stories for adults, including Uh, new iconic voices like LeVar Burton and Nick Offerman narrating some of the stories. 
I love Nick Offerman. I what know. A good Jake voice. can't read you a bedtime story. It's like fa- fair enough. Nick Offerman can. Incredible. They've also soothing music from artists like Sam Smith. There are guided meditations, breathing exercises, and a lot more to help you relax and de stress. And at calm.com slash spirits, you can get a limited time offer of 40% off a Calm premium subscription. That includes hundreds of hours of programming, unlimited, all available to you in Calm premium. Yeah, over 60 million people use Calm and you can join them today by going to calm.com slash spirits. That's 40% off unlimited access to Calm's entire library with new content added every week, by the way, at calm.com slash spirits. Thanks, Calm. We are also sponsored this week by Third Love. Third Love does bras differently. They believe that everyone deserves to feel comfortable and confident every day. And with the right support, they can help them do this. Literally. Calm has a fit finder quiz that helps people in under 60 seconds with a few simple questions find the perfect bra for them. It is there to ask you questions that you didn't know actually determined what bra was the best fit for you, like your breast shape or like, you know, the the styles that best suit that. Uh, And the perfect fit promise guarantees that every customer has 60 days to wear it, wash it, and put it to the test. And if you don't love it, you can return it. And Third Love will wash it and then donate it to someone in need. And Third Love's team of expert fit stylists are dedicated to helping you find that perfect fit. They're always available for chat or by email. And then returns and exchanges are always free and easy. Which I appreciated because I was able to try a couple different styles. And if you are kind of wondering what size is best for you or whether a certain cut will work with the clothes you wear, it's really easy and free to do that return. Yeah. So Third Love knows that there is a perfect bra for everyone. And right now they're offering our listeners 15% off their first order by going to thirdlove.com slash spirits to find your perfect fitting bra. That's 15% off your first purchase at thirdlove.com slash spirits. And finally, we are sponsored this week by Tab for a Cause. This is one of my favorite, fastest, easiest ways to support causes that I believe in while just browsing the web. It's a browser extension, so you can install it on Chrome or Firefox, whatever browser you're using. And every time you open up a new tab, it shows you a pretty picture with an ad at the bottom. And revenue from that ad goes to charity. So you can join Team Spirits and help us see how much money the conspirators can raise for charity at tabforacause.com org slash spirits. Thanks, Tab, for a cause. Thanks. You're helping me have a little moment of peace and also raise money for charity. That's tabforacause.org slash spirits. So, Julia, let me walk you, please, through a timeline of vampire books, movies, manga, and TV shows throughout the ages. You got me some vampire manga? Man, you did. shouldn't have. I know. It was very exciting. So I was going to say these mostly focus on like uh, Western European and North American depictions of vampires, but I do think we have a, a fairly decent spread. Um, but if there are some vampire you know, media that you love that you would love for us to check out, feel free to let us know. So the oldest reference that I could find, apart from the poem that you mentioned at the top, is a book called The Bride of Corinth by my homeboy, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Woo. So Goethe published uh, this poem, The Bride of Corinth, in 1797. And the most, uh, and if you don't know who Goethe is, it doesn't matter. He's an extremely dramatic uh, German writer. And um, my, my favorite and most drama-filled lines from this poem are, From my grave to wander, I am forced still to seek the God's long-severed link, still to love the bridegroom I have lost and the lifeblood of his heart to drink. So this is translated from German, I should say, but I love that translation. It is Uh sassy. It is fiery. It is. It's wonderful. Fuck me up. That is good. I know. And I also liked, which I haven't really seen before, this link between a love that you had when mortal and drinking that specific person's blood. If we fast forward about a century, that brings us, of course, to the the daddy of all uh, English language vampire (laughs) literature. He is the daddy of it, isn't he? It's Dracula. Mm. Now, This book, which I haven't read before, I didn't realize was told in epistolary format. That means that it's told as a series of letters, diary entries, newspaper articles, and ship's log entries. It is very good. It's like the first uh, audio fiction podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Needs a conceit to it. It's like a scrapbook. (laughs) It's extremely good. Amanda, have you sat down and watched the... um, the new Dracula show on Netflix. Not yet. Written by Stephen Moffat and Mark Gaddis. 
I'm I'm a little burned out to be honest on uh, on on Moffat, but I'll consider. I it. will say the first two episodes very good. Last one not my favorite. So do they play with or kind of reference this like metatextual element of being told from different media? They do in the first episode uh, because the implication is that Jonathan Harkness has written his account of what happened while he was in Castle Dracula. Hmm, interesting. Yes, and it's being read by some uh, some nuns that found him. Interesting. And the castle, like you mentioned, does play a big part in the novel. Just a couple other um, interesting elements I found. Uh, so the novel takes place like chronologically, first of all, and largely in England and also Transylvania, of course, within the same year, uh, between May and November. And then there's a short note at the end of the final chapter that's written seven years after the events outlined in the novel, which I thought was funny because like yes. seven is such a kind of occult number. Yeah. Also, the seventh child, if they're all there the same, be destined to become a vampire. Also a question for you. Um, so Dracula buys property in the book under the name Count DeVille. Is mm-hmm. Cruella a vampire, yes or no? <sighs> <laughs> the, the answer that popped into my head is like, yes, but only drinks Dalmatian blood. Maybe so. I don't Maybe. know. But Who can say? I thought it was very funny. <laughs> And there are also a lot of elements, of course, of the things we associate now with like canonical vampire texts. So there is garlic, um, a a doctor who is treating like a a victim of Dracula's. They know that she's experiencing blood loss, which to their credit, like, I don't know if I could have diagnosed just like seeing a pale person who's like cold all the time. Um, But they (laughs) they they prescribe garlic specifically as a palliative for the blood loss. Um, Specifically, quote, garlic flowers should be placed throughout her room and weave a necklace of withered garlic blossoms for her to wear. So very, in my mind, Ophelia vibes of just like being covered with dried flowers um, as you go to your eventual doom. You know what? I just Googled something. um, So garlic is said to accelerate red blood cell turnover, which might have something to do with the idea that like, feed garlic to a victim of someone who is suffering from either anemia or blood loss. Oh, yeah. Like, I, I know for sure there are definitely health benefits to garlic. Yeah. Um, and I, I, you know, to their credit, they knew what to prescribe. But yeah. that was really interesting because it's not necessarily a vampire um, repellent. It's just associated with a vampire's victim. Yeah. And we talked about it, that uh, garlic and also a nail through the temple, I believe. Oh, yeah. Is the uh, way to destroy a vampire. So similarly uh, to your list of ways to kill a vampire mentioned earlier, um, there are also a couple other things that people try to prevent either a a victim from being turned into a vampire or vampires from moving. So uh, crosses are placed over a deceased woman's mouth to delay her conversion or hopefully prevent it. And sacramental bread is also placed in boxes of grave dirt to prevent Dracula from using them. Sure, sure. Makes sense. Makes sense. That's actually one of my favorite parts of the novels when they do like, so Dracula has like a bunch of houses where he has his yeah. like caskets full of dirt yes. <laughs> where he can like go and hang out and they do like a raid on all of the places that they know mm. he's located in and that's how they make sure that he can't sleep there. Nice. They also eventually kill Dracula um, by cutting him through the throat with a knife while at the same time uh, a mortally wounded Quincy, the uh, kind of supporting character, stabs the Count in the heart with a bowie knife. Uh, Dracula then crumbles to dust, which again we see very often in successive vampire media. Um, and the uh, his victim, Mina, is freed from her curse of vampirism as the scar on her forehead disappears. So there have definitely been other examples where like if the sire is killed, then either the um, other vampires are let go of some kind of thrall, but I don't think I've seen their vampirism reversed at all. Yeah, no, that typically is not the case, I believe. Typically, they would also just like be let go of their curse or something to that effect. So I guess if perhaps if the transformation is not fully occurred, like if you're not in the goose (laughs) or if you are still in the (laughs) goose state, yeah, um, they they won't be uh, fully transformed or what have you. Totally. And as you no doubt remember, um, at the end of the day, uh, the castle is destroyed. And the there's actually a fragment of text I found on the Wikipedia page that was removed from the original manuscript, um, but quoted here, which I just thought was a really kind of wonderful invitation for us to think about why we like horror. Mm-hmm. Um, so this goes... From where we stood, it seemed as though the once fierce volcano burst had satisfied the need of nature and that the castle and the structure of the hill had sunk again into the void. We were so appalled with the suddenness and the grandeur that we forgot to think of ourselves. Huh. Interesting. 
So that to me is like, you know, we see a spectacle, we see something unexpected and a little horrifying. And it's not just because we're gluttons for punishment, <laughs> you know, and like want to, um, I don't know, make ourselves suffer. But it's because it it takes us out of ourselves. And just like the sublime, like the literary concept of the sublime is something that kind of like awes and terrifies you so much that you feel uh, not like an individual, but like a, a part of a bigger universe. Um, I think that's kind of what a lot of horror does for us. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. I love the examination of horror in particular. I need to read more like academic papers on horror. Definitely. And um, just a couple of fun facts to close out this uh, this Dracula the book chapter. Um, so you might ask, Julia, why have there been so many adaptations of Dracula? Like, why is it this specific story that becomes the like archetypal vampire? Well, it's because Bram Stoker fucked up his copyright. Um, so yeah, it was did. copyrighted in the U.S. in 1899 uh, when Doubleday published the novel. But when Universal Studios then purchased the rights to the book to make into the film, um, they discovered that Bram Stoker had not actually complied with a correct portion of the law, which meant the novel was placed into public domain. <laughs> That's so funny and so dumb. I love it. Uh, as a final little humanizing factoid, uh, people obviously throughout Bram Stoker's life were like, where'd you get this idea? You know, where did this come from? And um, at some point, he started claiming that he had had a nightmare caused by eating too much crab meat about a vampire king rising from his grave. Hey, Bram Stoker, what the fuck? <laughs> I didn't know that the crabs were the most occult food. I, apparently. So, something about shellfish. <laughs> Extremely good. <laughs> So we so move then into kind of the film era. Um, and there, of course, is a, a eponymous Dracula film in 1931, uh, which I will get to. But there were a couple before that as well, which really surprised me, um, starting with an American silent film directed by Robert G. Vignola uh, called The Vampire in 1913. This one was based on an eponymous poem by Rudyard Kipling, uh, who's a horrible racist. Uh, it stars Alice Hollister and Harry F. Millard. This is interesting because it's the first film that people cite as depicting a vamp character, also known as the femme fatale, which I hadn't really tied those two things together. But the kind of like deadly sexy woman um, was known for a time as a vamp. Ooh, interesting. I didn't know that. I'm like surprised that I didn't know that. Huh? Yeah. And in the film, it's actually interesting, too, because media is referenced in the film itself. Um, so the the main character moves to the city for a new job. He meets an adventuress, which sounds like a great title, uh, named Sybil. I, and that's, I'm putting those on business cards. Oh, yeah. And uh, of course, in the sort of like fairly sexist um, plot here, Sybil makes Harry forget about his uh, fiance Helen. But in fact, Sybil is a vampire who's going to ruin his life. He loses his job, becomes an alcoholic. Sybil abandons him. And then Harold goes to the theater and watches the, quote, vampire dance, which itself depicts a man dominated by a beautiful woman who eventually takes his life by putting a bite on him. And uh, Harold uses this, I guess, as a way to, like, understand his own failings. Yes. Oh, and, shit, that's me? Yeah. And tries to redeem himself. So, <laughs> so many layers here. That's just, there's a lot going on there. Uh, Prop Steen, 1913. <laughs> A mere nine years later in Germany, of course, we get Nosferatu, colon, mm. a symphony of horror. Still one of the best vampire films to date. It is. It is a silent German expressionist horror film. And uh, in fact, it almost uh, didn't become a thing that we know about because Bram Stoker's heirs sued the film team over this adaptation. It was an adaptation of, of Dracula. Um, and a court ordered all copies of the film destroyed. But a few prints survived. And that is how the film was preserved and can be regarded as a like masterpiece of cinema. Bravo, bravo. Good job, underground network of film lovers. Proud of you. Incredible. There is a lot of kind of changes from the novel. So like vampire is replaced with the word Nosferatu and Count Dracula is renamed Count Orlock. Oh, God, that shadow of him climbing the staircase. Oh, yeah. It's one of my favorite shots of all time. Yeah, it really is. So it is presented as a possibly archaic Romanian word synonymous with vampire. However, it was largely popularized because of that film. Seems like it probably comes from a Romanian word that means offensive or troublesome. Well, there you go. There we go. I think that's definitely true uh, because the film kind of focuses on how the townsfolk um, around Orlok, uh, like townsfolk are just dying. And unlike Dracula, he is not turning them into other vampires, but just killing the victims. Um, Orlok also would be killed by sunlight versus the original Dracula is only weakened by sunlight. Mm, interesting. 
Yeah, it's it's definitely seen as like an important stepping stone in cinema. It also is definitely, you know, trades in anti-Semitic stereotypes and uh, is not perfect in any way. Sure. Um, but it is an influential piece of how future directors and creators thought about vampires. And it's really interesting, too, because in a lot of the research that I did uh, about historic vampires and vampire traditions and stuff like that, um, the use of sunlight as like a deterrent or killer for vampires is not like super common like much like many creatures that we see in folklore and mythology like they tend to hunt at night or only come out at night because that's when people are vulnerable or sleeping uh but there's very little that implies that vampires are killed by sunlight or weakened by sunlight Hmm. that's really interesting yeah so to just kind of close out the Nosferatu legacy, um, it was remade in 1979 by Werner Herzog, who you might know from so many iconic films, which I thought was hilarious because I uh, never knew that. It is set in 18th century uh, Wismar, Germany and Transylvania, and it is like definitely like a stylized remake um, of the 1922 version. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And there's also Shadow of the Vampire, the film from the year 2000, which is a metafiction horror film uh, written by Stephen Katz, starring John Malkovich and William Defoe. So it's a fictionalized documentary about making Nosferatu, which uh, kind of, you know, uh, posits that the lead actor is, in fact, a vampire. I feel like William Defoe was made to partake in vampire like <laughs> media. Me too. And he was nominated for uh, Best Supporting Actor. So, you not know. surprised. Like, I love Willem Dafoe. What a good Me actor. Too. Me too. I'm also going to touch on some modern ones that I really enjoy. But in the intervening years, a lot of just uh, wild uh, vampire related stuff. Um, in 1948, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein <laughs> was part part of uh, several films where uh, Universal uh, trots out their IP and has Abbott and Costello meet, st- meet people like Count Dracula, Frankenstein's monster, the Wolfman, sure. et cetera, et cetera. Makes sense. There is Blackula in 1972, part of the black exploitation uh, horror film movement directed by William Crane. There was also a, a 1970s Broadway production uh, called Just Dracula, which I saw referenced mostly because Edward Gorey, who is like an iconic illustrator and book cover designer, designed sets for it, um, starting in Nantucket and then went all the way to Broadway. And I'll include a link in the Patreon director's commentary because they're absolutely beautiful. It's like a hand painted rendering of the catacombs in Paris, including like these huge arched ceilings. And it is just absolutely beautiful and creepy. Love it. Sounds incredible. And then moving into more uh, modern vampire media, I was really interested in kind of the where this idea of the vampire hunter came from. Um, And I'm sure, again, that could be a research paper of its own. Um, But I found a few interesting examples. There are some novels in 1983, uh, beginnings when they were published, Vampire Hunter D, uh, where this uh, titular character D wanders through a like post-nuclear Earth. uh, And there's lots of like Western elements, science fiction elements, horror, high fantasy. um, And this idea of the... There's like a thing called the nobility, vampires who planned for possible nuclear war and uh, like hoarded and sequestered all resources needed to rebuild. Um, And then they like rebuilt post, you know, nuclear horror, a uh, a, like big society of vampires only. Man, the 80s really fucked us up, huh? Threat of nuclear war, just like everything. Really did. In uh, in the manga series, Vampire Princess Miyu, which started in uh, 1988, uh, the the protagonist is stranded in the space between the human world and the demon underworld. And a uh, Japanese vampire girl named Miyu is both the daughter of a human being and uh, Shinma, which is a name for a race of, quote, god demon. Um, so she's born by a vampire. And now she has to kind of like turn all of the evil demons away. Um, she wants to like turn to that darkness herself, but not until she has banished all the other Shinma from Earth. Fun fact, Japan didn't really have a uh, vampire tradition or folklore until the 1950s. Really? Yeah. It's one of the few places that didn't really like develop one on its own. The closest that you can find is the Nune Ono, which is like the, it's a snake woman who drinks the blood of people, but like that's what snakes do. So fascinating. Mm-hmm. Well, there are a bunch of 
other interesting uh, manga and anime series. Uh, one of my favorites, there's Chibi Vampire uh, from 2005. Obviously. Yep. Uh, unusual vampire girl who, instead of drinking blood, has to inject it into others because she produces too much. That's adorable. What a cute twist. Yeah. There is Blood Plus, an anime series started in 2005, which is where the protagonist, uh, Saya Otanashi, has been living the life of an anemic amnesiac, which is incredible. <laughs> this is very good. Yep. Uh, and the bat-like creature uh, kind of attacks her and shatters her, you know, normal human existence um, and feeds on the bat. Saya learns that she's the only one who can defeat them as her blood causes their bodies to crystallize and shatter. I love a good magic girl with a twist. Yep, me too. And then, of course, there are uh, series that we grew up with. There's Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I can't not say it. There's Angel, uh, which also focuses, you know, as a spinoff series on the realities of, of being a vampire in uh, daily life. And there's Twilight, which is its own uh, version with its own kind of mythologies and mixes up all kinds of things in that in that old blunder. Um, and I don't know. I, I didn't want to focus really on those since I know them very well. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of info and more of the audience will be familiar with it. Uh, but just running through lists of vampire adaptations, uh, there's just so many things. There's like There's a video game called Nightwalker, uh, The Midnight Detective from 2001. Um, and there's just so many versions of interesting vampire lore. Um, but again, just the, the bigger takeaways that I got from reading through all of these materials is that vampires are usually either dominant parts of society through being like old and rich or in that, like I mentioned, post-apocalyptic situation or demons to be hunted. Mm -hmm. And generally for story purposes in a lot of these, there's a vampire that's good. Either they are a half vampire, they're cursed with a soul like an angel. Um, they've pledged to fight beside the forces of good. They're in love maybe with the fighter. And there is a reason why we have kind of like the vampire that's the exception. Yeah. Um, I'm going to name a couple more just so people aren't like, how did you not mention blah, blah, blah. Uh, Anne Rice's interview with a vampire series, uh, True Blood, and the, the novels that those are based off of. Um, actually, kind of to your point before, Amanda, you're like, I wonder where the uh, original uh, vampire hunter came from. And one could argue that the original vampire hunter comes from Dracula's Van Helsing. Interesting. Dr. Van Helsing, the, the like expert that they go to in order to be like hey man what the fuck what's going on how do we kill these vampires and Excuse van helsing me. is like i am old and i think german we can figure this out <laughs> that's awesome there's also being human uh which is one of my favorite kind of underground uh adaptations yes. i haven't gotten into vampire diaries but we can um but yeah i mean the <laughs> Yeah, I, I want to I want to preface this being like, we have probably heard of the vampire thing that you are excited about. I promise we probably have. You don't need to make a recommendation. We've probably heard of it. Yes, it's definitely, I know people are excited to tell us about things, but it gets overwhelming when we have dozens and dozens of those. Mm -hmm. But instead, why don't you pick your favorite vampire thing and share it with a friend and have them, you know, listen to the episode. You guys can get on the same page mythology wise. And then together you can enjoy your favorite thing and talk about the similarities and differences. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said earlier on in the episode, vampires are wide reaching. There's a lot of different stories. There's a lot of different traditions we didn't talk about in this episode, uh, but we hope that you found it interesting and we hope that you enjoyed Only Lovers Left Alive. Well put, Julia. And listeners, remember, stay creepy. Stay cool. Watch out. Thanks again to our sponsors at calm.com slash spirits. You can get 40% off a calm premium subscription. And at thirdlove.com slash spirits, you will get 15% off your first order. And at tabforacause.com and at tabforacause.org slash spirits, you can join Team Spirits in fundraising for charity. Spirits was created by Amanda McLaughlin, Julia Shafini, and Eric Schneider, with music by Kevin McLeod and visual design by Allison Wakeman. Keep up with all things creepy and cool by following us at Spirits Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Tumblr. We also have all of our episode transcripts, guest appearances, and merch on our website, as well as a form to send us your urban legends at spiritspodcast.com. Join our member community on Patreon, patreon.com slash spiritspodcast for all kinds of behind the scenes stuff. Just one dollar gets you access to audio extras with so much more available too. Recipe cards, director's commentaries, exclusive merch, and real physical gifts. 
We are a founding member of Multitude, a collective of independent audio professionals. If you like spirits, you will love the other shows that live on our website at multitude.productions. And above all else, if you liked what you heard today, please share us with your friends. That is the very best way to help us keep on growing. Thank you so much for listening. Till next time.